to get started um, on Lesson 7. Uh, we, we are halfway through this series. Does it seem like that's even possible? Um, so, happy you're here. Happy you found your way through the maze. Um, here's the magical cheese. So, uh, why don't we start with prayer? Gracious Father, we thank you for your love uh, that is the foundation for our faith, uh, that through Christ and his meaningful work of love, his life and death and resurrection, you have given us a secure place for eternity, a hope that is uh, certain, uh, a knowledge of who you are and what you are doing in our lives. You've also equipped us with a message to share. So as we look at our time here on earth and our purpose, uh, we ask, Lord, you'd, see, you'd help us to see that grand purpose of sharing the story of Jesus with others so they too might know and believe you and be prepared for eternity. As we look at uh, Thomas and Jude today, help us be emboldened by their courage to be courageous followers who share your story of love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we are going two by two at this point. Um, we are going to look at two disciples that really, apart from their uh, listing in the, the Gospels as apostles, the only Gospel that really gives us any information is the Gospel of John. So we're going to be looking at John today. So if you have your Bibles, crack them open to John. We'll be starting at chapter 11 there. Um, we're going to study these two apostles together because they share a common link. Beside the fact that they were called to Jesus to be his disciples and to be apostles, uh, Thomas and Judas, son of James, share the quality of courageous followers of Jesus. So, who was Thomas? We're going to take him first. Well, first we're going to look at his name. He's listed a couple times in the Gospels. Uh, John's Gospel tells us this about his name in chapter 21. Um, he lists the seven disciples who were fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Remember, after Jesus rose from the dead, they went back up to Galilee, and seven of them decided to go out fishing. Peter was the, the leader. Hey, guys, let's go fishing. Um, and one of the people that went out fishing with them was Thomas, called the twin. Um, in the Greek, it's actually the word didymus, and I think the NIV actually really translates that Literally, uh, Thomas called Didymus. Um, I don't, if you look at the different translations, um, Thomas is actually the Hebrew word for twin. Um, so it comes from the Hebrew word ta'am, uh, to be bound together. Uh, the first time that word is used is in Genesis when... Isaac's wife, Rebecca, gives birth to Tamim, the twins, named Esau and Jacob, right? Okay. Uh, so Thomas's name might be a name or it might be a nickname. That may not be his birth name. If he's called the twin, I mean, that's kind of an odd name to give a child, isn't it? It's more likely a nickname, like he's one of the twins. You guys ever grow up around twins? You kind of forget who's who, especially if they're identical twins, right? You just call them the twins because you can't tell them apart. <laughs> uh, I had two friends in kindergarten through third grade. We just called them Dean and Dan, the twins. And I couldn't tell you, well, actually I could because we were really good friends. We, we lived down the street from each other and I hung out with them and you get to know some of their idiosyncrasies that each of them has, right? Um, but most of my class just call them the twins. I don't know if you've had that experience. Um, so that's really the only indicator about Thomas's life that we have any understanding of. Thomas called Didymus. So he was Hebrew, right? And the Greek name Didymus was John's translation trying to help his Greek culture that he's writing to. He wrote the Gospel of John in Greek and he's trying to help them understand what does this mean? What does Thomas mean? It means twin, okay? 
Um, twin the twin is really what he says there in John chapter 21, okay? Um, where did he live? Well, we have so little information on these two apostles, but we have one indication perhaps where he grew up. You remember in Pentecost in, in Acts chapter 2 when uh, the crowd is hearing all of these apostles proclaiming the news about Jesus in their own tongues, in their own languages, right? Remember that? Acts chapter 2? And why were they amazed at that? And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Okay? So it's like if you heard someone with a New York accent speaking Italian or French or some other language, you might still get some of that their New York accent and how they're talking. They could tell these guys are all from Galilee, okay? They don't speak like the, the Jews from Judea. They have a different accent, okay? Kind of like uh, we call those guys up north, Upers, and they call us trolls, right? <laughs> um, can we tell the difference? Well, maybe by how they speak, we can tell, right? Um, so this is what's going on here. Is they're, they're gathered in Jerusalem, and they're like, aren't these guys all Galileans? You can tell by how they're talking. So it kind of indicates Thomas, and later we're going to see Jude, were from Galilee. That's the only indication we have of where they came from, okay? Um, which makes sense, because Jesus spent a lot of time up in Galilee, didn't he? Um, so Thomas is also known as Didymus from Hebrew and Greek words both names meaning a twin some have gone to great lengths to determine who his twin was because his name is paired with that of Matthew in the listing of the apostles there are those who suggest that maybe they have been they were twins okay uh, it may be best to say that we don't know who Thomas's twin was because the Gospels don't say he was Matthew's brother, okay? I think there would have been some indication if they were twins that they were also brothers because it's very clear James and John were brothers. Peter and Andrew were brothers, right? It uses that term multiple times for those family sets. Um, although he's not as well known as some of the other disciples, most people are familiar with the expression doubting Thomas. You've heard that one, right? It comes from the, the, the time when he was uh, not believing the other apostles that Jesus had risen, right? Because he appeared to them when Thomas wasn't there the first day. Um, so we're going to look at a few other times um, in the gospel where Thomas actually speaks. We don't have information about his call to discipleship. He simply appears in the listing of the twelve. And we learn something of the man from the three times he appears in the gospel record. So let's take a look at those. If you have your gospels open, John chapter 11. I know in the Bible study it says verses 1 to 16. I encourage you to go and read that whole chunk. I'm going to start at verse uh, 11 of chapter 11. Um, the setting is Jesus is... On the other side of the Jordan, by Bethany, where John the Baptist had been baptizing, he's spending time over there with his disciples, away from the, the eyes of the religious leaders who are trying to arrest him and kill him, right? This is just a few months before the final Passover he has with his disciples. And while he's out there, he gets word from some people he loved that a friend of his, Lazarus, was sick, right? And they tarry a few more days, uh, a couple more days, sorry. And then Jesus says, well, now it's time to go up because Lazarus has fallen asleep, right? Um, so pick up there in verse 11. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. How would you respond to that statement? Yeah. 
If he's sleeping, that's probably a good thing, right? If he's sick, you sleep, right? That's how the disciples interpreted it. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. First time we actually hear from Thomas. What is he willing to do? Die with Jesus, right? Apparently he had been listening. He knew the stress Jesus was under because the religious leaders were trying to corner him, arrest him, be done with him, right? Um, And Thomas is very aware of this. Um, Things are ramping up and Jesus has actually told them a few times already at this point, we're going to go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the chief priests and the elders and they are going to put him to death and on the third day he's going to rise again. Okay? Remember that. He knew exactly what Jesus said was going to happen. He says, I'm willing to go and die with him. Because where did Mary and Martha and Lazarus live? Do you remember? Bethany, which is just a couple miles outside Jerusalem. Okay? It was on the road. Um, So the next time we actually hear from Thomas is a few months later in John chapter 14. They're up in the upper room. Jesus has celebrated the Passover with them. He has instituted the, the Lord's Supper, right? And now he's preparing them for what's coming next. They're about to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane and he's going to be betrayed and he's going to die and he's going to rise again. And so he's trying to explain this all to them. And so in chapter 14, as he's telling them all these things, you have this interaction with Thomas. Let not your heart be troubled, he says. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? You spent three years with Jesus, and you still don't understand his mission, right? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Thomas probably wasn't the only one questioning what Jesus was talking about, but he was the one that was bold enough to actually ask the question, where are you going? We don't know. How are we going to follow you if we don't know where you're going, right? Um, He wasn't going to some other place on the planet, where was he going? Heaven, right? My father's house. All right. And then the one he's probably most famous for, after the resurrection, John chapter 20, starting there in verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord Jesus. Had, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. 
Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. you got ten guys who you've been with for the last three years who've had your back, who've been your brothers, and they all tell you, we have seen the Lord. And your response is, I ain't going to believe y'all. Unless I can actually touch Jesus myself, I don't believe you. Eight days later. So that was on the, the eve of Easter, right? First day of the week is Sunday. That's Easter Eve. Eight days later, which would be what? A Monday, right? Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them, and although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, break. Well, so they counted days. from evening to evening. So this was in the evening already. So they're probably already counting that. So it would have been the eighth day after that. So it was a Monday. The way they counted days. So. Thomas was not a coward. I mean, he's the only one on Sunday evening who's actually outside of the room, right? The other ten are locked in behind the door for fear of the Jews. Thomas isn't. Um, He demonstrates his courageous nature when the other disciples are trying to keep Jesus from going to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead. People in that area had tried to stone Jesus the last time he was there. Now when Jesus insists on returning, it's Thomas who boldly exhorts his companions, let us also go that we die with him. At a time when there are many who allow Jesus only a limited role in their lives, Sunday morning Christians, Christmas and Easter Christians, Thomas expresses his willingness to die for Christ. Years later, he apparently did just that. Outside of Scripture, early and respectable tradition records that Thomas traveled east and spread the gospel through Parthia, Persia, and India. One early tradition has the Savior appearing to Thomas and sending him to India And to get there, he hires himself as a slave to an Indian merchant and sailed to India. And according to the tradition, Thomas came to India in 52 AD. About the same time the Apostle Paul is doing his mission trips in the book of Acts, Thomas is in the other direction, going east, right? Um, And landed at, I'm I'm horrible at these words, so forgive me if I butcher them, Kandungalar? on the Malabar, presently Kerala coast. Uh, There he entered the service of King Gandafaris. He preached the gospel to the Brahmin families of Kerala. Uh, Any of you familiar with Indian culture? Yeah, the castes. And they had castes still back then. The Brahmins were the the priestly castes. So they were kind of a upper middle class caste. They had control over the religious uh, expression in the area. Um, So he preaches the gospel to them, many of whom received the faith. He established seven churches there, and later he moved on to the east coast of India, and he was martyred in 72 AD by a fanatic at Little Mount near Madras, and his body was brought to Mylapore near Madras and was buried there. Death came via a spear or a lance, which was stabbed through his body while he was kneeling in prayer. Uh, There are Thomas churches and Thomas Christians that claim their churches can be dated back to to his day. Um, 
So there's a picture on here of the tomb of St. Thomas. And it is down in the basement. Um, Dr. McBurney, who collected a lot of this stuff, I'm just going to read you a little portion of what he says about this tomb archaeologically. Um, the bricks in the oldest existing portion in the southern wall of the tomb are about 15 and a half inches long, 8 inches wide, and 3 inches thick. Mr. Longhurst, superintendent of the archaeological department, Southern Circle of India, who inspected the tomb in 1921, declared that these bricks were of great antiquity because they were of the kind found in the Buddhist stupas, only that those, the ones in the stupa, were larger, 20 by 10 by 3 inches. 24 years later, in 1945, excavations were made south of Mylapore in Archimedu near Pontaducherry, and for the first time in India, a Roman trading station was discovered, founded in the beginning of the first century AD. In the oldest layer, the buildings were of wood, and the ceramics found were of the first century. In the second layer, the buildings begun about 50 AD and abandoned before the end of the first century were of bricks. And the bricks of these buildings were similar to those of the tomb of St. Thomas in Mylapore, of the average size of 15 and a half inches by 8 inches by 3 inches. The bricks of the buildings added in the second century have already had a different size. So archaeologically, there's good evidence that this is actually from the first century a tomb of one of the apostles. Uh, it's kind of cool when you see archaeology can give us good information, right? Um, so uh, on the map, oops, the next map, there's a picture of where the, the bishoprics of the Tomasian church exists today. Um, there are, as of 2018, there are 3 million, no, 6 million, sorry, in, of 2018, 6 million members of the churches of St. Thomas that still claim to follow the faith of the apostles. You think in a country of over a billion people where the majority of them are either Hindu or secular, there are 6 million Christians still that can go back to the first century and say this is where our faith comes from. It's kind of cool. The gospel still resonates, right? The tradition that Thomas made it to India is confirmed by the testimonies of many of the fathers of the church. It was not difficult for the apostle to come to India because extensive trade relations existed between India and the Mediterranean countries even before the Christian era. And there's nothing to contradict this tradition. And so I have a, a map of known trade routes uh, from the first century uh, during the Roman Empire, um, the diminishing Parthian Empire, the Kushan Empire, and even some exposure to the Han Empire of, the, of China. So those trade routes were active in the first century before there were airplanes, okay? So the gospel had a way of spreading. Um, All right. So let's look at his symbols. Um, first, the first and probably most prevalent symbol for Thomas is a carpenter's square with a spear in it. Um, the spear or lance suggests the instrument which led to his death. Some say the carpenter's square is a, in the symbol refers to Thomas building a church at Malapar in India with his own hands. So a building for Christians to gather in. He actually built it with his own hands. Uh, Multi-talented young man, <laughs> or I guess middle-aged man at the point he would have been there, right? Um, others contend the square is a reference to an ancient story that Thomas built a palace for King Gandhafaras in India while his servant. So, a couple different ideas where the carpenter square comes from. Uh, the second most prevalent symbol adds four arrows to the carpenter square. Uh, and the third adds three stones to the four arrows. Uh, and the fourth keeps the stones but adds a leather girdle. 
All of them deal with the tales of Thomas's martyrdom. One later and unlikely account of his death claims that he was stoned, then shot with arrows and left to die, and later he was finished off with a spear. He just wouldn't die. Okay? Uh, any questions on Thomas before we move on to St. Jude? Yes. Okay, so the question is, why did Jesus appear on Easter when Thomas wasn't there? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. It just is. And that gives evidence that this actually happened because, I mean, if we were just building a myth, we would have said, well, Jesus rose and he appeared to all of his apostles at the same time. But here we have evidence that, yeah, we're still dealing with a broken world. One of the apostles wasn't even there when Jesus appeared to them, right? Um, and so he later comes back. And here you see the omniscience of our Savior, right? He knew what Thomas had said when the other apostles shared the good news with him. Well, unless I can do this and this, I ain't going to believe. So the first thing he says to Thomas, go ahead, put it there, put it there. See? Stop doubting. Believe, right? Um, what love our Savior has for us. He's patient with us even in our struggles and doubts, right? Yeah, for those of us who like the, the evidence, right? <laughs> um, he gives us enough of what we need, right? Question? Yeah, so Sunday morning when Mary comes back and tells them all, even the, even the other apostles didn't believe. So yes, they needed him to appear too. And they were eyewitnesses of his resurrection. That's one thing that they were. They saw with their own eyes the resurrection of their Lord. So why was it such a shock that Jesus could be re resurrected? Because they had, they had witnessed the raising of Jairus' daughter. But remember, only Peter, James, and John witnessed that. They all witnessed the raising of the, the widow's son at Nain because they were with Jesus in the train of people, right? Um, the only train crash in Scripture that's recorded for us. You have a train of people coming out of Nain going to the burial place for the, the widow's son. And you have a train of people coming into to Nain with following Jesus. So you got these two trains of people and they crash. And what happens? Jesus raises the widow's son. You know, um, Only train crash in history where there are no casualties. In fact, one more person survives than originally was in the trains, right? Okay. They are their own denomination. They aren't associated with the Orthodox. They just are their own. They've kind of always been isolated by the changes in history. In the 600s, when Islam became very popular, it cut off the Tamazian churches from the Western churches. And so they've kind of existed on their own for 2,000 years. They're, they're kind of more like associations rather than... So like in our church body, we have a very hierarchical structure, right? We've got synod and congregations, and we're all connected. They're kind of congregation to congregation. They have a, a different structure. And their, their doctrines are pretty similar to the early church and what we believe and confess. They believe that baptism is a means of grace. They baptize infants. They believe that Christ is truly present in the Lord's Supper. 
So those teachings for 2,000 years remain pretty insulated in India. They, yeah, right? <laughs> they didn't have all the, the warfare and bloodshed. They, they have um, flourished in the last century again. Uh, for a long time, uh, during the, the Portuguese occupied India for a while, and they tried to suppress them as a heretical form of Christianity because who did the Portuguese follow? The Pope in Rome, right? Um, and then when the British took over India, then they were supposed to bow to the king, um, but they still survived. They still kept their identity as Tomasian churches. They had to go underground uh, during the 19, 1800s and 1900s, but they're back flourishing now with their own identity again. So, and the interesting thing is, when we were in lockdown in COVID, we started having a bunch of people from India following our services. And that lasted for many months, which is kind of cool. So, all right. So let's look at Jude, the, the other apostle we're going to look at lesser known than the other Jude or Judas, right? Um, so what do we learn about Judas from these passages? Well, first of all, if you look at those passages where he's simply listed among the apostles, uh, you have a few different names thrown at you. There's Judas, which is Hebrew for the name praise, uh, the praise of Yahweh, right? Uh, Thaddeus, which is actually Aramaic, which means courageous, Labaius, which is Hebrew for a man of heart, another way of saying a man of heart. Yeah, courage and faithfulness, yeah. Here's, here's a, a strong and courageous follower, right? Um, and so then you have those, those variants. Um, Thaddeus, Labaius called Thaddeus, Judas son of James, Judas son of James, okay? Those are the four listings of the apostles there. Uh, and as far as where he lived, well, we have that same passage from Pentecost where it says, they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? So Judas, son of James, also known as Thaddeus or Labaius, was a Galilean. Okay? Um, although a number of the disciples are known by two names, this is the only one who has three names given in the sacred record. St. Jerome called this apostle Trionus, which means literally a man with three names. Okay, um, He's called Judas, the son of James, indicating his birth name. And to distinguish him from the other apostle Judas, John carefully adds the remark, not Iscariot. Uh, John wants it clearly understood that this Judas remained devoted to Christ. He must have been of a very different character than the other Judas, for his other names, Thaddeus and Labaius, mean something like strong heart, courageous. Um, Matthew and Mark avoided the name Judas probably because of the betrayer who had the same name. Matthew apparently used Labaius only as a translation of Thaddeus. In addition, some translators have rendered Judas as the form of Jude. And once again, it seems that this is done to avoid any connection with Judas Iscariot. Right? There's only one reference to Judas, son of James, in the New Testament besides those that list him as an apostle. So let's look at this one distinct example in the Gospels. Again, if you're in John chapter 14, this is that moment in the upper room after the other Judas has left the building, okay? He's been called out as the betrayer. He leaves, and then Jesus has this great discourse with the, the apostles. He prays the high priestly prayer in chapter 17, and then he leads them out to the Garden of Gethsemane. So we're in that upper room where he has this last conversation before his suffering and death. 
And so if, you, if you're open there to your, your Bibles, John chapter 14, starting at verse 15. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the, my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he, is, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, because... Iscariot's already left the building, okay? Judas, not Iscariot, said to Jesus, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the fathers who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, For the Father is greater than I. Now I've told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. All right. Pause there for a second. What was Judas's question? How are you going to show yourselves to us and not to the rest of the world? And what was Jesus' answer? Okay. Look at what he says again. You're going to keep my commandments. You're going to have the Holy Spirit in you. And who else is going to be in you? the Father and the Son. We will come and make a home in you. Theologians call this the unio mystica. The mystical union of the triune God with His people. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwell in us. They have set up their home in us. So as we face the devil and the world, and our own sinful nature, we don't face that fight alone. We have the triune God living in us. Who is greater than our God? Yes. John chapter 14, verses 24 and 25. Well, actually the whole section, 15 to 31. And... How long is God going to be with us in that way? Forever. Did you catch that? Forever. So if he begins this good work in you, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if he has called you to faith, he's going to be with you your whole life. No matter what trials or troubles come, no matter the temptations you face, God is not going to give up on you. Isn't that comforting? No matter the mistakes you've made, even after you're baptized, God is not going to give up on you. He continually washes away your sins and says, you are mine, I'm sticking with you. I, in fact, am in you. You are my home. The world doesn't see him, but we see him because we know this isn't from us. 
I mean, left to my own ways, boy, what a wicked, horrible person I would be. Right? The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the things God is manifesting in us. And we know that we are in Him who is true. Right? So Judas had a really good question. And he got a very beautiful answer from our Savior. One that we need to hear again and again. So this Judas was a faithful servant of the Lord for he's listed with the other faithful. Judas Thaddeus is not the writer of the book of Jude. Rather, the author of this short epistle was Judas, the brother of the Lord. Um, There's that explanation in the, the Gospel of Mark, remember? Jesus comes to his hometown to Nazareth, and the people of Nazareth say, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at Jesus, right? He pulls out the scroll of Isaiah and he says to them, today in your hearing this scripture is fulfilled, and they're like, this is the carpenter. He's calling himself the Messiah? We know his brothers and sisters, right? Um, They took offense at him. There's no way that the Messiah grew up in our midst and we didn't even recognize him, right? And if you read Jude, he identifies himself as the brother of James. He doesn't even say, I'm the brother of Jesus the Christ, but rather, I'll, I'll identify with James. Because I don't think I deserve to identify myself with Jesus. So it's a different Jude altogether. So there's three Judases or Judes in the New Testament that you got to pay attention to as you're reading, okay? Three different individuals. Outside of Scripture, the history of the church in Armenia claims that it was the apostle Judas Thaddeus and Nathaniel who preached to their country. Armenia eventually became the first country to claim Christianity as its national religion in 301 AD. Um, But even with this national claim of Christianity, the Armenian government was at first violently opposed to the preaching of Jude Thaddeus and Nathaniel and, according to historical accounts, was responsible for putting both of them to death. There's no mention of Thaddeus' journeys before the second century. Eusebius in the history of the church mentions his work in Edessa and actually found secular records from the record office at Edessa that, that he himself extracted and translated word for word. Records that mention a King Agbar who was healed of his disease by Thaddeus. Later, many apocryphal writings appeared, one which changed the story. And from this, we recognize that there were kernels of truth in many apocryphal writings, but that the accounts as whole are not trustworthy. So if you've taken any time looking at this, you may have seen that appendix in the back um, after the last Bible study. Um, Appendix one is a list of the apocrypha of the New Testament. So these were writings that the early church said, no, that wasn't really from the apostles. They may have some kernels of truth in them. They may have been stories uh, that were written down, kind of conveying the truth, but they're not Scripture, okay? These are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. But they may have some historical facts in them. And, And as they become later and later dated, those stories become more and more mythologized. They add, you know, more and more crazy things happening in them. Um, and so that's where, when I'm referring to what um, Eusebius was citing, that's one of those apocryphal writings. Um, so I give you an example of one. I actually copied it. It's a free text, so there was no copyright on it. So if you want to read the Acts of the Holy Apostle Thaddeus, that's these two pages on Appendix 2. So that's, I mean, just... Have, have some fun with it. It's, as you're reading it, recognize it's not Scripture, 
but it might have some historical truth in it that uh, stems from that early 2nd and 3rd century as they were recorded. All right? So the, the symbols for Thaddeus, the most prominent, is the ship, uh, representing the many missionary journeys which church tradition suggests he took. The second is a carpenter's square with a boat hook, So a little different than Thomas's because Thomas's had a spear, right? Uh, Sometimes he's symbolized with a club. Legends say he was martyred when he was beaten with a heavy knotted club. The fourth symbol used for Judas Thaddeus combines an upside down cross with a lance and a club in reference to some of the later and unlikely accounts of his death. The exact manner of Jude's death is not found among early church history. So... There you are. Any questions on Judas Thaddeus before we look at the discussion questions? Okay. Well, let's look at the discussion questions then. Uh, Thomas may have been a bit slow, but he was no fool. Like so many today, he wanted proof, and he got it. Thomas's reaction has earned him contempt as others review what happened. It's interesting that there is no condemnation of Thomas in the Bible, only Jesus' urgent plea to stop doubting and believe. How is Thomas proof that the questioning, probing, even doubting mind can find the answers it is looking for only in one place, the living Savior Jesus Christ? That's a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> Is God okay with our doubts? Yeah. He recognizes we still have our sinful nature that we're struggling against, right? Um, but that's not all we are. We also have a new heart, right? We are being formed, reformed into the image of Christ through the gospel. And so he says, just keep coming back to me and my word and you're going to find the peace you're looking for. Your doubts will have their answers. My promises and my faithfulness will help you know how much I love you and how faithful I am. And if we know Jesus Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life, then even some, of our questions, even some of our questions can be put on hold, right? We may not have all the answers we want, but we have all the answers we need. I still haven't figured out deja vu, but when I do, it'll probably be in heaven and it probably won't matter too much, okay? So let's look at John chapter 14. Um, both the next question and the following one are anchored in those verses where Jesus is speaking to the, the apostles, especially responding to Judas' question, right? Um, what courageous fruit of faith was Jesus asking of Judas? That's Thomas, and that's, that's after the resurrection. This is before his death. And Judas asked the question, how are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And what does Jesus tell him he needs to do? Keep my words. Hold on to my words. Hold fast. Keep, guard, protect my word. And when that happens... What does he promise? The Father's going to come and take up residence in you and I'm going to be in you. You are going to be our home. How does that help us in the visible church today? What is Jesus asking us to do? Stay in the Word. Keep after it. 
guard it, grow in it, right? And we have the promise of our God. If you do that, this is going to be my response. I'm going to come and take up residence in you. We confess it every week, don't we? I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. We believe in it because we can't see it with our eyes. We look at the visible church, we see how fractured it is, how there's all these false teachings mixed in with the truth, and we are disheartened. But God says you're looking in the wrong place. Look to my word and my faithfulness. There is one church, one body of Christ. Whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. And that's where we need to rejoice and anchor into is the truth. And those who believe the truth and walk with us. Okay? I believe in it because if I look to the world and even to the visible church, I'm going to be disheartened. But I believe what God says in His Word. That heart by heart and faith by faith, the triune God dwells with His people. And you see evidence of it in the fruits of faith, in the faithful confession of believers as they say, Jesus is the Savior of the world. Right? Okay, so in the following verse, uh, verse 25, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. According to this verse, why can we be courageous about believing and sharing God's word even the New Testament books written by the apostles. They actually heard what he said, yes. And then he promises they didn't just have to keep it in their own memory what was going to happen. The Holy Spirit was going to come and remind them of all things, everything he had taught them. What we have in Scripture is not just the words of you know, Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, but through the apostles we have the words of our triune God. This book is called the Holy Bible because it's the only book God himself has given us, inspiring the very writers to have the words written down that we needed. And it is living and active. It's the only book like that. Right? So if I want to know what Jesus said, where do I look? Right here. <laughs> right? If I want to follow Jesus, where do I look? Right here. Okay? So in these two apostles, we see the Lord's patience. Uh, in Thomas, we see him being patient in answering his doubts and his questions. And the result, you have a courageously faithful man who history says launched a whole continent uh, with the gospel. In Judas, son of James, we see the foundation for such courage, the very word of God given by the Holy Spirit himself. Um, so really kind of an encouragement for us to be bold and courageous too. Any questions? Yes. How, how did the, that's a good question. How did the apostles determine where to go? Um, well, we know with the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, he went where the church sent him. Try this out. And then as he went up in his first missionary journey, he tries to go west, and we're told, or the second missionary journey, he tries to go west, and the Holy Spirit says, no, don't go this way. And at one point, the Spirit of Jesus actually appears to him and says, nope, you've got to go that way. And then he gets to the very western edge of Asia Minor, the, the northwest corner of Turkey, and he has a dream from a Macedonian man. Macedonia was on the other side of the sea, Right? And he says, come over here and help us. So that's one example. We know where God led them. Um, Paul talks about planning. If you read the book of Romans, he says, I'm planning to come to you, and from there I want to go to Spain. And it seems like that he actually made it that far. I'm going to ruin the last lesson. Um, but 
the, the early church records some interesting stories. So for Thomas, for example, um, the, the Acts of Thomas the Apostle, he, he, Jesus appears to Thomas and says, I want you to go to India. And Thomas says, well, Lord, I'm kind of a fragile guy. I'm not sure I'd make it over there. <laughs> um, and Jesus says, no, you're going. And so he gets on a boat and he goes to India. Uh, now, whether that actually happened or that's just a story that evolved, um, there is good archaeological evidence that he went all the way to India. So, um, that answer your question? Yeah, we, did, we just kind of follow what the, the, the historical writings tell us. They did go out. They didn't just stay in Jerusalem behind a locked door. <laughs> okay. The language barriers. How did they? Hand, how did the apostles handle the language barriers? Well, you remember what happened on Pentecost. Yes, the early church had tongues. They were gifted by the Holy Spirit to know languages, not weird babbling like some of the charismatic churches do today, but actual languages. So they were gifted by the Holy Spirit to go to a place and to know. The language. So what happened at the Tower of Babel was undone by the Holy Spirit on Pentecost through the early church. And still today, if you talk to missionaries and they learn new languages, um, they'll say, you know, I, I've been learning this language and as, as I'm trying to share the gospel, all of a sudden, I just know how to talk. So God is still a giver of gifts. Um, he doesn't promise us all the gift of tongues. In fact, Paul said in the early church that tongues were going to diminish because as it went from nation to nation and people to people, they wouldn't need that gift anymore. Um, but it's still there today where it's needed. So, okay. so I won't be here next week. I'm going to be visiting my first grandchild. Um, yeah, I'm happy. But Pastor Nick will be uh, leading the study, and he will be uh, in the fellowship hall with you next week. So go downstairs next week for the Bible study, okay? All right, should we close in prayer? Well, Holy Spirit, we thank you for being with us today and reminding us of the things we need to know, especially the good news about Jesus our Savior and your promise that as we hold to your word, you and the Father and the Son dwell in us. We thank you for that. In a world that seems so broken today, we need to have confidence that you still exist, that you still are at work. Help us to see that in our own lives as you help us to grow in the fruits of faith and the fruits of the Spirit. I'll be with your church here on earth and keep her strong in your grace and your truth. All these things we ask in Jesus' name.